This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Let's get right into it. Um, first of all, welcome to the, the Bartholomew Town Podcast here. And what's, what's fascinating to me about your, your, I've been following your work, first of all, through my coverage and sort of interest in the Wyatt Detention Center and just generally kind of exploring Central Falls over the last few years. Um, now you're sort of stepping into a statewide profile running for Senate. You're a part of the Rhode Island Political Cooperative. Can you kind of, guess, I guess, just talk about what your message is and what you're trying to bring to the statewide conversation right now? I mean, we have these two Rhode Islands. We, the, the COVID crisis has highlighted it as well as any incident that I can recall ever where, you know, you have people in South County or Newport County that are experiencing one paradigm. And then on the other hand, folks in the urban core are really pushing the boulder up the hill in a much more significant way. So I guess kind of that was a long way of saying sort of explain where you're coming from and, and what you hope to bring to the Senate. Right, absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, of a geek, so I might make some, uh, <laughs> some excellent reading references. Um, but, you know, I, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to bring is a different type of, of leadership for Central Falls and Pawtucket um, to the State House. We tend to think about power as outcome based, you know, what we see, what happens. Um, but uh, theorists on power, particularly folks in the 1970s, uh, this guy by the name of Stephen Lukes, who wrote about a book, short pamphlet, Power, a Radical View, talks about what you don't see. So power is also what doesn't happen. Um, and I think we've historically had uh, a, a relationship with the state where, you know, we were seen as, as almost patrons. So you're lucky for what you get and be quiet, don't speak up, you know, we'll, we'll negotiate these kind of backroom deals um, for what we're willing to give Central Falls and Pawtucket. Um, and so you didn't see things like more aggressive representation for our community, things like driver's licenses for undocumented folks, uh, folks really speaking out about school budget cuts, uh, folks publicly addressing the Wyatt. Um, and I think it's time for us to change that. I'm, I'm not a, a quiet guy, I'm, I'm pretty outspoken, and, and I think I represent the the needs of, of the community right now. Uh, and so for me, I, I looked at it as a kind of three strike um, drive or motivation for why I got involved. So I was, I've, been, I've been on the council now two terms and you know, out, you know, it, and not in any particular order, you mentioned the Wyatt. So one of the things that did bother me was when stuff started happening at the Wyatt, uh, only our state rep at that time, uh, Representative Maldonado spoke out. Uh, everyone else was silent. Um, and so that, that started bugging me. Then when we were supporting a resolution, or, or rather putting forth a resolution supporting a woman's right to choose at the state level, I personally reached out um, to my state senator, making sure that, that we would be supporting and codifying Roe v. Wade in our state legislature. She guaranteed that she would as long as it didn't go beyond um, the original Roe v. Wade ruling. And 24 hours later, ended up voting against it. Luckily, it passed, but that was strike two. Strike three for me was when they announced that they were going to implement budget cuts for our school system in Central Falls, and nobody from our local delegation showed up. Nobody spoke up. Um, and I think, to me, it, it speaks to this different type of power that's been exercised in Central Falls and Pawtucket, which is you need to come to us in private and, and not have a, a kind of public debate about the needs of your community. And I think the days for that are over. Um, we've, been, we've been walking, we've been demonstrating, we've, we've been showing that we're engaged. Um, and I think folks are, are, are ready for someone a little bit more outspoken uh, who knows how to engage with, with the power structure as it is and, and hopefully change it. Yeah, I've used this example on the podcast over the last year or so, you know, a couple of times. Number one, I grew up in, um, in Charlestown and went to Charaho and then URI. And I was involved as, I was actually, frankly, I was a soccer referee for like 20 years. And that's how I paid my way through school. So I've had the opportunity to get in to the various communities of the state, we'll say, for forever. I've been refereeing at the Lusitania Club in Central Falls since I was 16, or since before that, my dad would drop me off there. So I've had this at least perspective. But, you know, I can remember, you know, we'd have some game or whatever basketball game or whatever and the coach would say okay you know we're playing against Central Falls hey everybody make sure you keep your eye on your stuff you know everybody's straight to the bus afterwards there's always been this negative connotation it's always been as you mentioned sort of like all right backroom deals we'll get we'll, we'll take care of you you know almost treating Central Falls Pawtucket certain parts of, of Providence Woonsocket as minions 
Um, and it's time for that long past, long past time for that to change, obviously. But I think in order to do so, you need to be especially outspoken. And unfortunately, you have to be able to be passionate, outspoken, but also able to reason with those folks that have no clue about the struggles of the urban core. Do you think you have that in you where you could sit down and you mentioned driver's licenses, I think of, you know, minority leader in the house side, Blake Filippi, who he was pro DACA, pro driver's licenses. So there are allies, unusual allies. Do you think you can pull the state into your message, I guess? Absolutely. I mean, look, there's two parts of it. One part is showing folks how mutually co-constituted we really are. Um, and that, that they're, you know, these, these things will affect you in the long run. Um, and so I think if you start appealing to that, to that logic, then folks can start buying it. So, you know, for example, one of the things I, I tell people is for a long time, we were talking about the declining youth age population in Rhode Island. Uh, so folks in their young 20s were leaving, but it wasn't just that, is people were having less kids. Um, and and those, those shifts take time to, to really show their impact. I think the, the most, um, you could call it, uh, the, the, the most serious implication there was the closing of schools, right? So in Warwick, people were flipping out um, about the closure of schools, but it was because you had less kids. Um, and so any demographer, anyone who was following kind of population trends and fertility rates would have been able to tell you like, hey, by the way, in a few years, in, in 10 years, in 20 years, there's gonna be less kids in, the, in these school buildings. And so we're gonna need less buildings. Now, where that's not true is in the urban core. And part of it is because immigrants tend to have slightly more kids than, than native whites. Uh, but the reason why that's important and, and puts us kind of in this together is it's the active, young, slightly close to middle age workforce whose tax, whose income tax props up the services that our seniors uh, benefit from. And so if we don't have enough people educated in good jobs in our workforce, paying income taxes, we can't afford the services that we have guaranteed our citizens. Um, and so it is the kids of Central Falls, Pawtucket, uh, Providence, Woonsocket, uh, whose tax income is gonna help us fund um, the services that we're gonna get when we retire, that our parents are gonna get when they retire, which is much sooner, and that our grandparents are receiving right now. Um, and so we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by systematically undereducating them, by systematically defunding uh, programs that are aimed at their, their development. They're all around development, right? So it's not just education, it's also uh, youth sports, which you mentioned being a part of, um, different clubs and um, electives and, and things like music and art. You know, there's no music program in the Central Falls High School. Uh, and so we're, we're not only robbing those kids of their future, we're robbing ourselves of our future. Um, and so we need to see kind of how integrated our society really is, how dependent we're going to be on these folks, just as in some ways they're dependent on us. Um, and, and so I think if we can start having that conversation with folks, uh, they'll see it. The other thing is that, I mean, there's an immediate benefit for you. It doesn't surprise me that much that, you know, the minority leader supported, supported driver's licenses. If there are more undocumented drivers or really unlicensed drivers, excuse me, on the road, then your insurance companies are going to charge you more. You know, your premium is going to be higher because they, they factor that into their equation for how they calculate rates. Uh, <laughs> and so we can turn and look at insurers and say, hey, listen, um, we now have driver's licenses for everybody. We have less folks that are more likely to leave in a hit and run type of situation because they're afraid of getting arrested or something like that. Um, and so please, you know, stop eye gouging us on, on these prices. <laughs> then, then we all kind of stand to benefit. Um, and so I think having those conversations and doing so in a way that's not just adversarial. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, kind of get in a boxing ring and, 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 and spar over some of these things. But the, the more important way of doing this is, is to appeal to people's humanity and get them to recognize that, look, we're in this together. Um, and the fact that CF and Pawtucket are some of the communities being hardest hit by COVID, but that we're trying to rush back to open our economy, this is where the workers live. You know, like it, it, you don't get a, a business if your workers are dead. You can't get a product if, if your workers are sick. Um, and so we need to think about those workers when, when we're moving forward and, and remember that they're, they're a part of our, our society and, and that our survival is contingent on theirs and theirs on ours. Absolutely. I mean, let's focus in now on, on COVID. And, you know, there's a far right wing group that their, their whole campaign here in Rhode Island is, all right, we want our summer back. You know, it's just really childish. Um, 
nonsensical approach to opening up the economy. Some folks are demanding that we go back to 100%, that the, the, the crisis is a hoax, et cetera. I feel like that's a much smaller group of people. I know when I've gone to cover some of the rallies that they've held at the state house, it's been a hundred people or so, and they, there's not really an organization around it. It's sort of just a general, don't give me a microchip, that kind of talk, you know, more new world order protest than anything like that. But at the same time, you know, we see exactly as you point out, the governor you know, would be one example being the equity council that they've established, which until recently wasn't necessarily representative of many of the communities that are most impacted by the virus right now. I mean, they hadn't rolled out translations beyond American Sign Language and Spanish until like a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, you've got testing sites that you still need a physician's referral for. Many of the folks that are most impacted right now don't have any sort of physician in their life that they can turn to. So from your perspective, what can be done to, for lack of a better term, get this dialed in in CF Pawtucket and really start to get to a point where, you know, the numbers are declining from a scientific perspective, but also it is more realistic to say, all right, let's start opening up the economy comfortably. Yeah. So, I mean, I think first off, we're already doing that in CF. Um, and so I have to kind of take my hat off to um, our mayor, our, our director of health here, which is Dr. Michael Fine, who used to be the director of health of the state. Um, they took a really proactive approach at coordinating services and getting test sites set up. I mean, I think in some ways the state has taken credit for some of that stuff um, and they have helped uh, for sure. But, but really it was, we were kind of on our own. I mean, it, it's like the classic both flaw and strength of the federalist system, which is like everybody figures it out. If you succeed, then you know the centralized government or state will take credit. If you fail, they'll be like, ah, oh, well, you were on your own there. So, <laughs> uh, but all that to say, I, I think we're already addressing it and we're working on it. Um, one of the things that I think Dr. Fine is is really um, good and humble about that I don't know that our our government tends to be this way is recognizing what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And, and in some ways it's, it's hard to call people out on that, but if, if you're arrogant about not recognizing it once you are called out and bringing people in, then there's a problem. I think what you just spoke about with the equity council and, and kind of who's on it and how that's changed is about folks calling you know, the, the government out and saying like, look, you don't have the right people at the table. You know, Dr. Fine doesn't speak Spanish fluently. Dr. Fine doesn't speak Portuguese or Portuguese Creole very well. Um, and so as soon as he started trying to mobilize, he started reaching out to people who do, who are part of that community. You know, one of the things I, I, I kind of jokingly say about our state's public education policies all the time is, you know, how is it that we're trusting people who never went to public schools, who don't send their kids to public schools to make policy about public schools? <laughs> it, 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 there's a disconnect there. They, they don't know the experience, um, and yet they, they, they think they have some kind of God-given right to legislate it. And so... You know, I think if, if once you start recognizing your limitations and start including people who, who kind of complement those and say like, hey, look, I might not understand the experience of a worker in Central Falls, but I'm going to talk to a representative of an organization or I'm going to talk to a straight worker in Central Falls to help me figure that out and to inform my policymaking, then I think you can start having an impact. And so here that's meant you know, getting on the radio, getting on the news channels that folks in the community watch, um, speaking to folks from the Cape Verde and uh, Cultural Association and saying like, hey, how do we get all this stuff translated? Like, what's the, what's the most effective way of communicating with folks that are in your community? Um, and that's been a real, I think, kind of grassroots effort, but again, a recognition of what you don't know and how to, how to fix that, how to address that. Um, and that takes time, um, but I, I think it, it shows in a lot of the weaknesses in our, in our state and, and, and kind of local institutions um, that we're not good enough at recognizing it yet. Definitely. And one thing that's been interesting to me as well is, is I've been working on some, I guess you would say, act, action groups um, on the back end. And, and you know, Omar ba, ba, for example, bringing up the point that a lot of, from the Refugee Dream Center, a lot of the food that is distributed isn't culturally appropriate food to some of these folks so they you know you know there's there's a lot of details to just get people to buy into the messaging to get people to buy to trust in the institutions themselves that are somewhat basic steps you could take i mean you don't have to obviously we the, the society does need to be rebuilt at in many levels but 
something as simple as having culturally appropriate food, translated messages on WhatsApp. Um, you know, someone for me, I've pointed, I got tested for COVID like a month and a half ago or something like that. And what a, what an operation with all due respect to the, uh, the national guard and, and, and the military and so forth, but what an operation. I mean, you pull in, you it's like, you got checkpoints, you know, I'm putting my license up against the window and my hand shaking. It's like stressful environment. So there's a lot of just basic changes that can be made to accommodate communities that right now are disenfranchised. Again, that's not going to solve many problems, but it might get some more buy-in, some more trust built. And as you mentioned, if you don't have people who understand that experience on these decision-making boards or bodies, um, it's almost impossible to get there. And then, you know, folks on Block Island, they're psyched about, you know, they're going to open up Ballard's on June 12th. They've got a concert booked, this, that, and the other. And then when I mentioned that to the governor, you know, WPRO slams me for being a Karen. And it's like, no, who do you think is going to work in the kitchen? Who do you think is going to work on, on the boats? Who do you think is going to perform the music? Who do you think is going to, you know, not necessarily the owners of that facility, but beyond that, there are folks that are vital parts of that machine that are just being completely overlooked in this process. Yeah, look, and, you know, I want to thank you and, and other members of the media for, for pushing some of these kind of, uh, you can call them more sensitive topics, but the reality is that, you know, it, it's, it's fucked up. People have to die in order for other people to take this more seriously, right? And so, you know, I often think about how Americans um, view war, right? And we scaled back the way that the media was allowed to cover war after Vietnam. And that was intention, right? The, the United States government realized that once you see the gore, once you see, you know, our own people dying, other people dying, it, you, you start losing support for that movement. And so you don't see images of, of the war in Iraq, of, of, the, of the war in Afghanistan, of the war on terror, uh, the way that you used to see images in Vietnam. We have much better cameras now. And, and, and that's not a coincidence, right? And so, you know, getting back to, to our state issue, um, right after we opened, they stopped reporting for a few days. And, you know, it, it's, it's completely um, conjecture, but I believe part of that was because it was going to make us look bad. Um, and so until folks see the bodies, until folks see the people dying, and they're real people to them, right? I mean, it's why the New York Times is getting so much um, praise right now for, for their, their Sunday uh, coverage, for their Sunday front page, right? Because when you see the names, these are, these are real people. You can, they're not just numbers anymore. Um, it's, it's really jarring. Uh, and it really, it, 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 it takes you aback. And so, you know, I, I think folks who are pushing for the open, who are thinking we're being too sensitive, once people die, I think they'll have to take it more seriously. But in order to do that, we have to continue to spotlight the deaths. Right, like you have to show the, the gore of the war in order to, to push to end it. Um, and, and in some ways, this is a war against the virus. This is a war against misinformation. Um, and so folks have to recognize that people are dying, that in Central Falls, we have people dying in their homes because either they were afraid to get tested, they didn't have good information about the test. Um, they, they were afraid to go to the, to the hospital. They might not have had insurance or what have you. Um, and that stuff isn't getting covered in the media. And you have to ask yourself why. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, you don't want to, I get the not wanting to create a sense of panic, but you do have to have a, a sense of reality. And I prefer the truth over anything else, right? The, like the truth in the long run will set you free, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, and I think we tend to prefer comfort over truth. Um, and and I, I prefer the truth. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Authenticity. And going back to just an example of my, my own experience here, I you know, again, I'm not trying to be, a, you know, law enforcement or a snitch or anything like that. I honestly, I'm not, that's not what I'm out to do. I don't, I have no interest in doing that, but I was out for a drive like last week or whatever down in Narragansett and it was all kinds of chaos down there. But then what really struck me is when I, I came back, um, I live in Elmwood and I came back and, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Roger Williams Park and you've got a large police presence, again, not really doing anything, but just circling in an intimidating manner with their lights on, you know, literally five or six SUVs circling at all times. Just a few minutes down the road in, in Warwick, I heard the clink of a softball bat. And so let me, let me pull in. There's a parking lot full of cars. 
a game was going, people in uniform, you know, kids playing, not kids, 16, 17 year old people playing in a travel softball game. And I'm thinking to myself, man, what a double standard. And if you're going to shut down youth sports by and large, that, that needs to apply across the state. You can't have, you know, some sectors of privilege allowed to play organized softball while at Roger Williams Park, if you're tossing a Frisbee around, you're going to get, the group's going to get broken up by the police. So that double standard, and again, I got a ton of pushback for this from a, a certain portion of the audience and other people said, oh, I'm totally, I totally 100% agree with you. It needs to be consistent. I guess that's the real challenge the governor has right now. She's not an evil person. I, you know, I don't think she's mean spirited by and large or, or, you know, trying to hurt people, but it does seem like she has leaned on commerce by and large more so than, in my opinion, anyway, on the statewide health challenges that we're bound to experience as we reopen up. I don't know if you can opine on that right now. You don't have to throw the governor under the bus either. I know you're running for Senate. I'm like, you know. <laughs> so, so look, the, you know, what you just mentioned makes me think of two things. The first is getting back to this, you know, the, the extreme version is when people die. Uh, the, the less extreme version is, is when people get sick or when people test positive. And so it made me think of the Bundesliga, right? They, they try to host a game, um, two teams, no fans. Uh, and within 48 hours, several players are tested positive, and the <laughs> the coach of one of the teams had been ordered to quarantine for two weeks, right? And so, like, you know, these are, these are professional leagues who are trying this and haven't been able to, to pull it off, um, and, and who immediately, you know, pulled back. Um, and so I think, you know, folks are going to try pushing the limits, um, and hopefully if we have good information, good testing, good infrastructure – uh, to show them how dangerous that is, they will contract again, is, is, is one side of this. The other side is, is something you mentioned about policing. And, and um, you know, I think when we think about enforcement, when we think about some of our institutions like police departments, fire departments, um, schools, uh, I often wonder how much we could change by thinking about who we're, we're bringing into those institutions. So I didn't know this until I, I was doing some digging back when Providence was looking at the Community Safety Act. Um, but Providence up until like the 1960s had a residency requirement for a significant percentage of its police force. Um, I think police departments, fire departments, and school departments look very different when they are at least somewhat reflective of the communities that they serve. And that's, I'm not talking about like just ethnicity or race or class. Um, but just the fact that it's a neighbor, um, you know, there's, I think there's a different level of accountability. There's a different level of comfort. The way that folks interact is very different. Um, and, and we know that the majority of the Providence police force now does not live in Providence. Uh, we know that the majority of the school teachers in Providence do not live in Providence. Uh, and I think there used to be something similar here in CF that surely continues to be the case in our Central Falls schools. Um, but we had a, a councilwoman uh, Councilwoman uh, Stephanie Gonzalez, who wanted to change uh, the face of our police department and our fire department to make them more reflective of our community, um, and did that by working with them to change some of our, our hiring and recruitment practices. Um, and now we, we have a, a police force that looks a lot more like our community. Um, many of them grew up here, many of them grew up and still live here. Um, and so I, I think you know, our, our police force is by no means perfect and, and is still a, a work in progress like all institutions. Um, but I feel much more comfortable with our police department than I do with others. Um, and, and again, I think it's the residency piece, the where you grew up piece, not just the identity piece. You know, when folks talk about um, kind of ethno-racial identities and institutions, I grew up in Miami um, a lot of our teachers were Latino and Black. That didn't necessarily make them effective because there was still a disconnect between our neighborhoods or our lived experience. Um, and so just looking like someone is not enough. Um, you have to understand um, their, their lived experience. And I think that when you live in a community and you work in it, um, it, it changes your dynamic with people because you're going to see them when you're grocery shopping. You're going to see them when you're walking your dog or out on the park. And so you don't want to just have a like authoritarian, almost, um, you know, uh, the negative type of relationship. You, you want to work on building something positive. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. 100% agree. All right. Let's wrap it with, uh, you know, sort of 
number one, you're a part of the political cooperative. And I've been interested in the, in the co-op since its origin. You know, first it was, oh, Matt Brown's got this progressive group. And I think people have started to realize what it is now, <laughs> that it's more than just Matt Brown. Um, not that, not the, you know, it's not about Matt Brown and my comment, but just more so that it's, it is an all-encompassing group. Do you feel that there is, obviously there is an appetite for, I guess you would say, in, in the context of institutionalist politics versus outsider or new ways of thinking politics here in Rhode Island, whether that you know, even outside of just the context of party lines, do you feel like that you're going to be able to ride that wave or are you kind of focusing more on your own or is it, uh, your own credentials, your own issues, or is it a balance? How, I, I guess each candidate is, I'm sort of curious about that. How much are you leaning on the co-op for, momentum versus and that notion of just change um writ large versus you know jonathan acosta's central falls here's my body of work how what's that balance like yeah so so homophily is an idea that uh like people are, are drawn to each other right um and i am very against uh individual candidates i you know i i think that we we get too excited over individuals and it ends up kind of uh, obscuring the the practical policy outcomes that we should be expecting. Of. I say that as, as a person who my, my first election that I was able to vote in was Barack Obama's 2008 uh, presidential campaign. So I got sold on hope and change and then, you know, kind of started getting lost in the water of like, what what is what is it that we should be expecting? Um, and so coming into working with this group, one of the things that I made very clear to them is like, um, you know, we need to be very clear and explicit about our ideas so that when folks are talking about us, they're not talking about us as individuals, they have to engage in our policy proposals. So you have to explain to me why you think that raising taxes on the top 1%, we're talking about people who make more than $466,000 a year um, is a bad idea. That impacts, I would argue, none of the constituents in my community. And yet the way that you frame the discourse and manipulate it is to make us seem as if somehow that's gonna adversely affect us. It's not, we only stand to benefit from that in Central Falls and Potomac. And so you need to talk about why raising taxes, putting the rate back where it was before, like people were fine with paying this. They would just rather not. <laughs> and and they, they manipulated our state legislature to get out of that, right? You have to explain to me why healthcare for all isn't 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 good you have to talk to me about why recreational marijuana is a bad thing we know that mass incarceration is a failure we know that people in central falls and Pawtucket have criminal records over bullshit um and so like why is this a bad idea you have to tell me why increasing the funding formula for english language learners having that as part of the formula increasing the the coefficient on urban school districts is a bad idea right and so if you guys are willing to do that and mind you it's starting to work like people are stealing our ideas. You know, there are people right now in the state house who have proposed bills that were our ideas to begin with. And so the like pessimist in me has told the group before, I was like, you know what? I don't care that much about winning as long as our ideas win. If our policies proposals win, then like ultimately that's what we needed to get out of this. I wasn't in here to be a career long politician. I told my opponent when I met with her to tell her that I was gonna run against her. I said, look, I can live in a world in which you win. I just prefer one in which I do. And if you at least have to engage with the ideas that I'm putting on the table, then I can walk away knowing that I did something right. Um, and so working together, I think has been about developing these ideas a bit further, being more specific about what our education policy looks like, because I would love it if when we got in there, you know, day one, we could just propose draft bills and have to debate those draft bills. Right now, like I mentioned at the beginning, the way the power structure works is you don't even see the bills, right? Like we haven't seen the bills because they're all negotiated ahead of time. I want you to have a public debate. I mean, we're a public body. That's what, that's what you know, public governance is about. And so day one, when we go in, I would like, I would love to, even if they don't let my bill get to the floor or go to a committee, like I would love to just give it to the media. Here, here is our minimum wage bill. Here is our income tax increase bill. Here is our recreational marijuana bill. Here is our driver's license bill. And now you ask them why they're not letting it go to a vote. Because you have to be held accountable to people. All the power that's exercised right now is in the dark. And so you, you wonder like, well, how come they're not talking about this? Well, they are. They're just not talking about it in front of you. 
Yeah, the Capriccio Accords, as I say, you know, the restaurant downtown. I mean, that's where a lot of these bills are hammered out. And frankly, it's it's inaccessible to the average media member even. And look, a lot of the institutionalist media here in Rhode Island, and I don't necessarily mean that in this like hyper negative way or anything like that. A lot of these people are good people that just took a job that pays better than doing your own thing. But that is partially you know, a reason for the, the fact that this stuff stays in the dark as well, because um, the, the, the concepts aren't explored in the form of a debate in front of the, the average person. So, you know, you have somebody who doesn't really have an understanding of even recreational marijuana, the apartment cannabis at this point. Um, they have, you know, they have no concept of, of what that means other than, all right, well, yeah, it would help with the, uh, the 800 million dollar deficit you know they wouldn't understand the criminal justice implications or the health care implications that go with that necessarily it's in the dark yeah so so i think being in this group has create has created this this really dope space where we're able to develop some of these ideas further but also hold each other accountable so when this is over you know some of us will win hopefully all of us but some if, if some of us lose you know there, there's still the expectation that you're moving this agenda forward um, and being able to hold the group accountable rather than one individual, you can say, well, I lost, you know, I tried, or I won, but now I have to make these concessions. Ah, but you agreed that this is what you were going to push forward. And so if you're going to make a concession, address that public, right? Like have that conversation public. And, and, and that, that's been, you know, like I said, the, the whole true thing is really important to me. Um, and so, but also being able to, to bounce other ideas. So right now, something that's been really concerning for me is the ballot signature requirement. Um, it's, it's something that I know that the Board of Elections is, is considering, um, that the state legislature needs to, needs to act on. But at the end of the day, you know, Central Falls is the most hard hit community. It would be irresponsible for me to go and knock on hundreds of people's homes and potentially spread the virus either to them or get it myself. Uh, my candidate is, a, or sorry, my opponent is a retiree. Like she, she could be putting herself at risk because, because it stipulates you need to be present when you get the signature. Um, and so I think it's, it's beneficial both for incumbents and for, for us as, as, as uh, challengers uh, to, to eliminate the, the ballot requirement for this session. And, and it's something that as a group, you know, I've been able to kind of bring to the table and be like, look, you, your, your community might not be hard hit, but mine is. Um, and so are you willing to, to use your voice to, to protect the people in my community, to protect me as a, as a fellow candidate, as a fellow member of this group? Absolutely. Well, that's, that's something we're going to be seeing play out over the summer. And um, obviously it's going to have to be adjusted at some level. There's no way that they can allow for, for people to go knock on doors or, you know, there's no events to go stand in. And, and I've followed a lot of candidates around in 2018. And that's a, that's a process that is honestly, nobody wants to have to deal with <laughs> either. It's not. Um, and I mean that from, a, there are very few ex exceptions in my opinion, where, a citizen is really getting engaged and informed in that moment. It's hot. You're at some kind of event. You just want to go to the food truck or whatever it is. And it's, it's a very procedural type of affair anyway. So it's not like, you know, you're cutting off the legs from a legitimate election. If you get rid of that phase of it anyway, especially in the midst of COVID-19. Yeah. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast.